Sweet. And we're streaming? Yay! Welcome to the Con. Um, are my slides up there? Wow, because my screen looks funny. Must just be the hangover. Um, so what, what's this about? Um, every year since I think the first MooCon, uh, we've run a, uh, this own the con thing, talk, whatever, uh, where we try to present the information of the behind the scenes of ShmooCon, and there's a variety of purposes for this. Um, one, there are rough edges when we run this event, um, and we want you to see how we're trying to address said rough edges, what we do you know, to try to make this as good an event as possible, to build some trust with the community so that people continue to want to come back to ShmooCon. Uh, but also, there's lots of people who want to run local events. They want to do, you know, uh, they want to run a conference or they want to run some sort of get together. And there's a lot of questions about you know, what are the legal issues, how do you get volunteers to work together, um, you know, how do you order swag, all this kind of stuff. And so what we try to do is get all this information captured and on, you know, stream it and get it on video and whatever so that in the future when other people are trying to run their own events, they can look at the mistakes that we've made and hopefully not make the same mistakes uh, um, that we did. So um, with that, we may plow through certain topics just so that they get caught for posterity on camera. So I apologize if I start cutting off questions or anything like that. And there will be some on-the-fly engineering, apparently, of whatever is about to occur. Left your notes. All right. Well, that's not the worst thing that could happen. I can't actually see my slides. It's really exciting for me. Um, so we uh, formed ShmooCon LLC a number of years ago. We decided not to go the 501c3 route. Um, nonprofits can be a lot of work to set up, and it can be a lot of work to maintain. You have to have meetings and things like that. The overhead for an LLC is you have to pay the state, and that's it. Uh, it's really not that complicated. Um, yeah, it's, it's about the most simplest form of, of, it's not really a corporation in some states, but it works for our purposes. So we are not a nonprofit. We don't purport to be a nonprofit, um, but it's not because we're trying to make money, just that we're trying not to have more work upon ourselves than necessary. Um, and one of the, re you know, it, technically, we don't have to disclose any financial information because we're a regular corporation, but we tell you because we want to, and we figure that kind of makes up for not being a nonprofit because we open our books to you so you can see what we did. Um, organizational structure. Um, so the Schmoo Group predated ShmooCon, although I think that may be lost in the annals of history at this point. There are a lot of people that are aware of that predated the con by a goodly long time. Um, but we already knew each other as a group, and we were a very geographically disparate group of people. So we were very used to communicating and organizing via email. So uh, when it came time to organize the con, there weren't a lot of phone calls or hanging out in IRC channels or anything. It's just email. Um, and over the years, people have gotten pretty good at knowing what their roles are and just kind of starting the engine, you pull the cord, and people start doing their things, and we form more mailing lists as we need, and we're off and running. Oh, you did? Lists for, and a lot more, oh, there were a lot more phone calls this year. I lied. We used we fancy technology, you know, Klondike 5, whatever. Um, so the one thing that's interesting, we run our own mail server. We have for years and years and years and years as the Schmoo Group. Um, and there's a lot of on-the-fly mail list administration that goes on as we add and remove people. I can't imagine having to do it with some of the free stuff that's out there. Um, it's actually one of the biggest pains in the ass that we do is run our own mail server and almost also one of the greatest things ever because we can set up aliases and bring mailman lists online and, and whatnot. So um, it, once you get a mail server running, it's quite nice to have your own, but it's a kind of a pain in the ass to get to that stage. But thankfully, uh, we have some good mail guys on staff, if you will. Um, Conference dates and venue. So this was a new space, like last year was a new space. We kind of like stirring it up. Um, so we're in the same hotels we were in last year, but we were in obviously this giant ballroom thingy. Um, we didn't have any really crazy congestion points. There were certainly some choke points in the vendor area, I think. Um, but that was more kind of how we laid out vendor tables than a, the issue we had last year, which is there were structural beams six feet apart that everyone tried to move through every hour, and that did not work out as um, anyone would have planned. Um, there were a lot more rooms for other activities. Um, you know, all the contest rooms had tons of space compared to the last year's, which was really nice to be able to um, spread out into that space. Um, I mean, did people, I mean, it wasn't a big cattle drive going between talks or anything like that. Did anyone feel a <laughs> wooey or anything that's good? Thumbs up. Did you miss that? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, don't go knocking DEF CON for that. Um, boo, sorry. Yeah, look at me be hypocritical, jackass. Um, 
so the, it, I, I think it was a little squirrely. I mean, there was the entrances on this side with the stairs, and I was asking the security folks out there periodically how many people are using the stairs, and it's like, yeah, no, and not a lot. You know, <clears throat> most people were scooting down this hall and coming in, so it was really kind of a backwards setup, I think, the way that we had the room set, but the stage is over there, and so that's where they set it. So um, the dates tend to float. I mean, DEF CON is, you know, that last weekend in July every freaking year. Um, for us, yeah, they are a lot bigger. Um, we have some adventures in planning, uh, both from a personal perspective within the group. People have different things going on. Um, also, we tend to only, up until recently, plan about a year in advance. And so finding when the hotel has three days in a row that we can get that, um, you know, we kind of just shoot for January-ish, February-ish kind of time frame. Um, and so there's been a lot of variance um, in that. But um, one time we were in March. Yeah, one time we were in March. Um, I think we may have started planning that. Which may happen next year. No, no, no. We have yeah, ne and next year we will be... There's no commitment yet. Next year's an inauguration year. For those who aren't aware, there might be a presidential election coming up. Um, <laughs> I, I hear the mainstream media might pick up on it soon. Um, <laughs> giggle. And um, it's a challenge to plan things in D.C. around when said inauguration is going to occur, uh, even afterwards, because I think the lobbyists then come in and all get loaded and get ready for the, the new administration. So um, there may be some shifts next year in venue. Um, we only, yeah, we will not be here next year. Yeah, we will not be here. Uh, we may be up the street back where we were the last pre the previous years, but then we will probably be... We will be back. We will be back here. Actually, that's, that's in stone. We'll be back here for 2014 in this space. So... Um, in this, in the IBR, right? Yes. Yes. So we'll be in this exact same configuration. So if you if you liked it this year and you don't want to experiment, just skip next year altogether. <laughs> Come back in 2014. Pretend like it's hope. It's only every two years that we're here. So. <laughs> next year's the hidden contest. <laughs> the hidden con the, the, where's the con contest? <laughs> Anyone that shows up to my my house, I'm going to have a double barrel and a hound dog. Uh, uh, speaker selection, um, you want to talk about this? Yeah, we had, we had this year a real embarrassment of riches. We got, as I said, 215 submissions in. That 109 came in on the first date, which meant that by the time that we had read most of the 109 that we usually do for early submission, the, it was almost time to close everything, so we just didn't do an early selection. There were the early leaders, but it, it wasn't needed to encourage people to finally submit. Um, we also ended up with a huge number of great submissions. We rate on a one to six scale. There were eight more talks with an average of 5.0 out of six or higher than there were slots for them. So if you are an attendee, this is absolutely great because, you know, we had all sorts of great talks, more than we could possibly show to you. If you were a submitter, I'm really sorry because there were a bunch of absolutely fantastic submissions that for one reason or another, either from the one Russian judge rated you down to, to we just didn't have space that an otherwise great talk didn't get in. Um, you know, Please submit again for next year. Uh, you know, we we really could not make this be a great con with all of without all of the people who take a risk and take the time to submit something. I just wanted to say that the word is officially out. That we um, have a quote rejected speaker offer. If you submit a talk and don't get accepted, we've um, given people the option to buy a ticket. With that number going up every year. That offer is going to change, so don't assume it's a given. There you go. Um, to the point where someone uh, submitted a talk uh, that was effectively how to troll the, the CFP Woo! and uh, <laughs> oh. listed about half the people that were at the con anyway as co-presenters. And, 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 that, <laughs> and that talk was rated by more reviewers and given a one out of six by every reviewer. Yeah, we can't. <laughs> You can't give it a zero, as it turns out, so you had to give it a one, so you did get some credit for trying. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and to add, to, to, to make uh, John and the rest of the selection committee's life easier, and in general, when interacting with any event... Keep going. It's, it's on the slide. Oh, it is? Is it on a slide it's later? It's on a slide later. Okay, I'm going to shut up. Um, <clears throat> so every year, uh, we've had... Um, uh, 
Has it always been? Yes. Darth Maul has always done? No. no? No. Who is it? This is Frank. Oh, this is Frank. I'm sorry. It's Frank. Uh, Frank goes, we have a, a person who goes through and looks at all our submissions. A person. a person. He's a guy, you know, with hair and legs. Um, <laughs> he goes through and he, we, we, you know, we wonder, like, you know, of all the submissions that we get or all the talks, these are the talks accepted, right? Yeah, accepted talks. What the distribution is, um, you know, for offensive and defensive, and uh, I can't see my slides, so uh, miscellaneous and hardware, <laughs> what does that say? Hardware what? I can't read it. Like electronics. electronics, as opposed to hardware or soft tracks. I don't really... <laughs> That's a weird one. Uh, anyway, it, it's, a, um, it's an interesting trend um, over the years. The defensive talks, um, you know, in the beginning, when we started tracking this, were actually very few and far between. It wasn't that the, we weren't getting necessarily a number submitted. It's just that the quality never really made the cut. Um, and this year, we had an awful lot of really high quality defensive talks, and they almost caught up to everything else, uh, which is, from my perspective, I enjoy seeing that. Well, it's you also know. maybe the first year that our track names actually made sense. Oh, yeah, <laughs> where Build It actually was about building things to protect systems as opposed to, well, it's just a bucket to put the extra bracket stuff in that didn't fit. Um, so that looks like it could be used defensively. <laughs> Scoot it over there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was actually a really nice uh, uh, breakout this year and pretty even distribution, but I think part of that's attributed to the fact of the sheer number of talks that we got, um, and we could low-level pretty reasonably between the, tr uh, the tracks. Um, this is uh, submitted talks, um, and you'll see actually the defensive talks that were submitted uh, were actually a, um, you know, still a relatively small percentage compared to, um, uh, compared to the rest, the miscellaneous bucket. I mean, there's a lot of miscellaneous stuff that ends up in this room in the Bring It On room um, that comes in. So, I don't know um, if you can read that. You can ask Frank what it says. Wow. Um, no, I can't. The miscellaneous category had more reverse engineering, malware, and smartphone exploit. And Android development. So I, I'm not sure why exploitation didn't end up in what? Not handwriting. Not handwriting. Handwriting. How to handwrite was not a submission. Um, I find I can't do that anymore since I type so much. Anytime I have to write more than one sentence, I fail at it. So um, clearly, Frank has failed at it as well. No, that's my handwriting. Oh, that was yours. Oh. <laughs> that's cool. I need to ride home. Um, if anybody. All right. Uh, number of talk submissions, um, a nice uh, upward trend, um, and actually... Why did we go down? I don't know, but that number for this year, we don't have 2012 in here. Well, no, Frank. It's okay. This, there, there's a larger bar at the end. It's just, it's, it's hidden. Yeah, yeah, the bar at the end is twice as high as the other. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Between 2008, uh, when we had less than 100, and, and 2007, we've more than doubled in the last four years in the talks that we have to, to review and look at. So um, as John points out, it's no small task now that we have this many talks submitted. It's a lot of work. I mean, it is just a lot of buckle down, read, rate, read, rate, read, rate, and just keep going. I find, I mean, everyone, I think, has a different process. I get cynical, and that's when I realize I have to stop. Like when I put in snarky comments in the comment section, I'm like, all right, chill, dude. And like, just <laughs> take a break. <laughs> Probably need to do something else. Um, this is your slide. So there's one thing that's kind of come to, we've realized that this year, in the years past, it's been kind of obvious, but this year in particular, and this was dealing with everyone that had anything to do with the conference, whether they were submitting CFPs or, or vendors or attendees, please, 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 Read and follow directions. It's not complicated. Reading comprehension is something we started working on in first grade. And people fail dramatically. Excuse me? You run a hacker conference. I do run a hacker conference. But it, it turns out that if you want to participate in said hacker conference, we don't have a lot of sympathy for the where's the venue kind of emails. Um, and, and I swear to God, we get all kinds of things. Things that are on the website that people feel it's, more, it's easier for them to email us and take our time rather than take the five seconds to look at the damn website to find. Well, uh, also, if we have 200 plus submissions and your submission was a PDF file that you named .txt, it makes it harder for the reviewers to, to review it and they might just go on to the next one. Yeah. There were 12 of those? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, there were ones that didn't have talk titles in them. Well, that's cool. Like Every it's, single one of them had a name associated. They did have names, yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's weird, like, what people would miss in their write-ups. And sometimes the write-ups are just a miss altogether. Like, you're like, wow, that... <laughs> um, but, you know, really, we're very clear 
in the instructions in the CFP, this is exactly what we want. I think there's an all caps section in there, like follow these damn directions, and we still get people, I mean, these educated people who have done research and whatever, you know, don't have your research spoiled by the fact that you can't reply to our CFP appropriately. We don't have a complicated CFP. If you write about 200 words, you can have a pretty decent CFP submission, you know, and, and it's very readable by us and it's something we can vet. It doesn't take a long time, but people don't do it. You'd be shocked. Um, so please, 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 if you, you know, wherever you submit, if you go out and you're going to be involved in another conference, please just take the time to read because your information gets bundled up with hundreds of other people's information and if the reviewers can't divine what the hell it is because you haven't given them all the information, it's going to go in the bucket. You know, you don't have a good chance of making the cut. Uh, and please, um, spell Schmookon correctly. Like, <laughs> please God, even like McAfee the other day tweeted, that they were going to be at ShmooCon and they'd retweeted something else where the ShmooCon was spelled correctly and then they misspelled it in their tweet. And I'm like, there's only one C and it's in the con part. Um, like, we're not the British spelling of ShmooCon. Maybe there's a corresponding like ShmooCon in the UK where they use a C, I don't know. But, all right. That's an absolutely that blank slide. <laughs> Does it build? Is there a build? Oh, no, it's just the next slide. Um, <laughs> all right. You want to do this? Um, no, you can start, but I will, I will fill in the blanks. Yeah because she knows I'm not going to get it all. Um, so we still do a multi-round ticket sales process. Um, it used to be a, a three rounds with three, um, yeah, three different pay scales, or pay scales, um, price levels that you pay what you thought the con was worth, so kind of a Burning Man model. Um, unfortunately, it became so successful that it was just pay whatever the hell you can get your hands on. Um, so we flattened the price out to one, uh, one price, but we still have three uh, sales. We've decoupled getting a reservation to buy a ticket from the purchasing process for a variety of reasons. Um, one of them is in the past when the system would get buried um, and then people were trying to buy tickets at the same time other people were still trying to reserve and the server would thrash around. We would end up with credit card transactions in really hokey states where the transaction would have gone through but the person never got the response from the web server and then they would submit again and submit again, and suddenly somebody's paid for their ticket a bunch of times, and then we have to go in and refund you know, $1,000 worth of tickets. And the banks don't like it when you're refunding massive amounts of charges and you have to do all these chargebacks and things like that. So uh, we've decoupled that process. It also allows us to do um, to a manual audit of what went down, because it turns out people want to come to the con, and shockingly, People may write bots and things like that in an effort to try to get more tickets. Um, and so we do actually look through the logs before we release uh, things for payment for people to be able to come and pay to see if there's been shenanigans. And if there are shenanigans, we address it um, right yeah, then. Except in the last round this time. Yeah, yeah, well the shenanigans have to reach a certain threshold because there's always some shenanigans, right? Um, but it, we do, I mean, and, and people have these questions, you know, that it's, it's our, you know, uh, what, well there must have been bots. Well clearly there's a hell of a lot of people hitting this. There are some bots, but we have countermeasures against them and we look for it. And if there's a huge block or we see some trail of something, we're going we're gonna to address it. So this isn't something where we're just blind to it. This is something that we're very active even after you have your registration code. We're busy little bees looking through this, making sure that everything's right before we start accepting payment. Because once we start accepting payment, for us, that's go time. We don't want to have to then refund a bunch of money. Um, no, I just want to explain the terminology, or you, maybe you can better explain it, but the terminology between held and then wait list and actual reservation. Yeah, so when um, you get to the site and you, you the first thing you do is you, you um, uh, hold your you get two tickets initially, or one, depending on what's available, and then that is held. Held for you, and then um, then you move it to a reserve? Well, then, yes, and then you move those tickets to a reserve status, but in the meantime, what is also happening is once all the tickets are held, we have a certain spots for the wait list. Right. And you correct me if I'm wrong, because... I'm saying this all, like, you know. Yeah. So, there, was, there was a great amount of help uh, in the cart over the years, and it's a number of cooks in the kitchen that made it better, so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that one doesn't have horns. Um, so what's interesting is um, <clears throat> we started the year on the, the Django-based uh, system that we had, um, and we used that for rounds one and two, and that was behind the cluster, the big moose cluster. We had a bunch of PC, or PCs. This year we had freaking you know, dual-socketed quad-core Xeons um, in the cluster. They were, they, it was a slight upgrade from the TF2 boxes that I had to cut the feet off to get fit in a rack last year. Um, yeah. <laughs> 
So, um, but then after the second round, um, you know, we, the second round was again, you know, kind of thrashing around and the load balancer, we had the 503 error thing going on and um, had to like figure out how much the load balancer could let through and how much the database could handle, how much the web service could handle. And we kind of just said, all right, let's try something different. Um, and we rewrote it as a web server module running like in the address space of the web server. Um, and didn't have a lot of bells and whistles, wasn't framework based, it was very decoupled from the rest of the system, but it was goddamn fast. <laughs> like, it was crazy. It was, it was interesting because in the past, like, we will have windows open on all the servers and we're looking at tops and everything and watching the, the load progress up and we can see that, that 12 o'clock spike when people are hitting it and we see all the inbound connections and we're ramping up to thousands of connections a second. Um, on the, on the actual registration web server with that new module, uh, once we hit go, the web server process didn't even hit the top of top. Like, that's how efficient this thing was. And like, I'm like, are we live? They're like, uh, yeah, we're sold out. I was like, <laughs> that thing's cool. <laughs> so add all those numbers up. I mean, that is essentially, it took, in each of these, in each of these sessions, you see 30 seconds, two minutes, 2.2, 2.4. In each of these sessions, it took about anywhere from like, what did we say, Dave, a second to two seconds to fill the wait list after that. So once that wait list is full, that is when we consider ourselves sold out. Nobody after that point is gonna get a ticket. Add that up, what does it equal? I didn't do it, so somebody tell it's me. It's like two minutes and 35 seconds. Yeah, something like that, so. Okay. I realize that those numbers are not gonna add up to the numbers you're gonna see here in a little bit, and we'll explain why, but. She'll explain why, I'm not gonna. Mm -hmm. What? 1,400, 1,400 tickets? Oh, right, yeah, and then there's that. Um, so anyway, I think we have a pretty good foundation for next year uh, as far as getting past the uh, F5, 503 excitement that we've had in years past and the moose cluster failing. Um, so we'll, yeah, what? Go ahead. I okay, just... we're, we're gonna have new problems, I'm sure. Um, but I think that this boogeyman that's been on our back for a long time, I think we could, hopefully can put to rest um, and we'll see, see what fun we can have next year. Um, and I don't know if they're all in this room, but there are essentially, sorry, there are essentially three people who um, have put a lot of their blood, sweat, and tears into this, um, let's call it a project. Um, and it's uh, Dave and Kaz and uh, Ben Laurie, who I don't think, he's probably sleeping. Um, anyway, so we are, we are. Yay, just, guys. We love them. Um, so ticket sales, we sold, um, uh, a little bit larger. It was a little bit, Jesus, my math or English, damn it, it's wrong subject, um, is bad this year. Um, part of the reason we grew is, is the bonus round. Uh, we did the, you know, kind of Christmas bonus to test the cart. Um, and so that added a hundred and changed it to the mix. Um, and, uh, we were a little bit bigger space this year. So we threw a little bit extra in, uh, we had 1,809 out of 1,850 people check in. As of this morning. Um, as of this morning. Yeah, two people came in already today and checked in. <laughs> cool. They really wanted the bag. Um, <laughs> so that's 97%, which um, is pretty good. But even last year, in the snow, we had like 95% pickup rate, which was amazing given the weather conditions. So um, turns, that last year? yeah, that was last year. Yeah. We have really, really, I mean, we, in years past, we would actually have almost 10% attrition. Um, and then... Two years ago, two we had snow last year, too. Last year was we had the snow early and then the snow after. We didn't have the snow during. Two years ago, the snow was during because I was in snowshoes and the Marriott was telling me to get off the top of the... Anyway. Um, <laughs> no, no, it was not snowing in this. Yeah, that's true. That, that was exciting. Although this year it did rain sheetrock. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's like weaponized snow. <laughs> the guy goes out to his truck like, man, this, this, this is really stuck on my truck and flatten the fucker. Um, so 50 speakers, give or take, 65-ish uh, staff, 15 press. Press showed up a lot more this year. Um, we had a lot of press interest this year. Uh, we don't really advertise the con. We don't, um, uh, you know, it's, we feel it's important that the message from the speakers and the audience and stuff gets out, but we've never really um, been active in including the press um, and for right or wrong. Uh, we just... Yeah, I was in the post this morning, and, and, and I've seen yeah, some other uh, write-up. Yeah, and it's big press, you know, the Journal, Forbes, uh, Washington Post, that kind of thing, which is, is new for us. Well, we've had some, some big press before, but not, I think, to the, the scale we had this year. And a lot of them were like, I've never heard of you guys, but you seem popular. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, we liked it that way, but now you're here, so it's... <laughs> <laughs> 
yeah, who, who knows what will happen next year. Um, we, again, West Point uh, got, they brought 40 cadets down. Um, for those that have never been uh, to the uh, U.S. Military Academy up there, it's, um, it's kind of remote. Uh, <laughs> it's not, not a lot near West Point. And, yeah, there's a McDonald's directly off post, and after that, it kind of it's there's a river and um, mountains. Um, and so, for some of these uh, cadets, it's kind of a culture shock beyond just going to the military academy, but also to be in the middle of nowhere. So, for them to come off post and get to dress in civilian clothes and come down here is they really like that. Um, but they also like the opportunity to come down here and learn. They have a fantastic program up there, and we were happy to have them here back for like like the seventh year or some nonsense. They've been here. Been here since they may have been here, yeah, since, since yeah. Pukon 1, so um, that's fantastic, and we like being able to provide that to, to the, the Army. Um, and they have spoken, yeah, they have, almost every year for the last three or four years, so go Army. Um, yay, here's a fun topic, this gets people excited. Um, eBay. Third-party ticket sales, you know, the aftermarket, whatever you want to call it, um, we don't control what happens to the tickets by design. We don't want to get involved. We don't want to control you. You know, if your buddy wants to come see a talk, you can hand him your ticket. You know, you want, I can't make it. You hand someone your barcode. We don't arbitrate that. We don't want to get involved. It keeps our overhead low. Because um, honestly, when it comes to ticket mangling and going back and forth, that pretty much falls to her. Um, and she has to administer all that. And so when something happens, it takes a long time to unwind ticket issues and when we're trying to do other things. And so in general, it's just easier. The ticket's anonymous. You do whatever the hell you want with it. Um, every year, tickets are sold on eBay and people complain about it. But how many was it this year? 40 listed on eBay. 40 listed on eBay. Eight did not sell. Eight did not sell. So approximately 3% of the ticket sales ended up on eBay. Okay, it's not a massive number. It's a little larger than uh, than last year. I think last year we were around 2% two, uh, 2 of the tickets ended up on eBay. Um, and some of them, I mean, a lot of them appeared to be totally legit. Like, hey, I can't go, there were stories. There was um, at least one identified fraudulent ticket this year. Oh yeah, and we did have one bad, like actual made up ticket. So that was a new one. Um, yeah, <laughs> so we've, we're big enough and important enough that people are gonna sell fake things. We're like the Super Bowl. So I guess next year we'll have you download the hologram and put it on your barcode. Um, <laughs> that'll be exciting. Um, and there's some sales on Craigslist and whatever, and, but at the end of the day, you know, I'm not sure yet, we're not sure if this has reached a critical mass, you know, if this is a large enough number to give a shit about. Um, you know, people have thrown ideas at us on, on how to make this whole system more fair, on uh, how to control this. Um, it, it's interesting because um, this, the sales, when we sell out fast, we get a lot of emails like, hey, it's noon, and I came here, and it said you're sold out, what's the deal? Like, what, well, we're sold out. Um, like, I'm not sure what to tell you, and people are adamant, like, well, I had right at noon, I hit F5, and like, so did a thousand other people, and there were 200 tickets for sale. It's a FIFO guy, like, you get to deal with it. And then there's the inevitable, oh, well, you obviously have made a system that biases towards certain people. I'm like, it's hard enough to make the FIFO work. Do you really think? <laughs> Yeah, I was like, do you know how complicated it would be just to like say, I'm going to pick my friends based on whatever the hell information they're sending and move them to the front and still sell out in two and a half? Screw, no. Like, if you can do that, like, I want to hire you for my day job because that's, <laughs> that's a hard computer science problem, guys. Um, sir? What are your thoughts on maintaining size versus growth? Um, we'll, we'll get there. Hold that thought. Um, so at, at this point, the, uh, you know, our, our general impression, and, unless the community feels violently otherwise, is that um, this is still a very low rate, especially given that most of these sales appear to be legitimate, like, I can't make it, sorry, and I'm going to sell it, and I'm going to donate to EFF or, you know, Hackers for Charity. Or There's a lot of that going on. So when you really look at, like, the amount of, like, squatting and just, you know, straight-out profiteering on ticket sales, it's a really small number of tickets. My impression that um, a lot of the ticket sales go at cost. Or maybe for you can buy me beer at the bar. Yeah, yeah. There's like straight up bartering. You know, I got some chickens for some tickets the other day. It was kind of kind of cool. So. We see a lot of that in our sub community. Yeah. And I have no problem with that. Yeah. And last year I got mine off eBay. Speaker couldn't make it. Why sold it for charity? There you go. Piece of cake. Um, so why do we stay the same size? I get to George's question. Um, so. One, we like the feel of the con at this size. It's big enough that we get a diverse group of people. You know, it's not an insular group, the same group. Hey, I saw all these people last year. I mean, it's a different crew every year. Um, and 
you get very good information sharing, very good transfer of knowledge. People have a you know unique experience at this size because of you know there's enough people here for critical mass to be able to do these crazy contests and not have like one person like waiting for the contest to start. You'll get a bunch of people that want to participate. We get great speakers and that kind of thing. Um, but it's not so big that the logistics are unbearable for the attendees. You know, you're not walking across a convention space. Like I was thinking today, like I got in the elevator and went to my room, and it took less than two minutes. Right? Like at the Rio, when you go to DEF CON, and again, I'm not knocking DEF CON, there's just the example of the big one. Like, if I'm in the other part of the convention floor and I gotta go to my room, it's a, all right, I'm gonna put the backpack on, I'm gonna grab a soda before I leave, you know, I'm gonna get the Sherpa going, let him climb up in front of me and <laughs> hook up the ropes. Um, it's a long way to go, you know, and so being in a venue where you can move about the hotel rapidly and get in and get out and whatever is, is it's nice. Um, and also, I mean, with all due respect, you get staged at our house and now um, at, at my company, and we have another child too. Um, so Shmukan used to fill up, you know, it's brownie in motion, it would just, it would fill up the, the um, space that we had, which was our house, and now I've got a company that has an office and it's started to expand within there. Um, my company is not Shmukan, it's something else. <laughs> and so, but around this time of year, every, it's a storage unit for Shmukan at times, and there are TF2 boxes <laughs> scattered everywhere. And, it's more than a storage unit for Shmukan. Yeah, the interns get tasked with things. I replaced one of the interns chairs the other day with a bunch of projectors and said, test me on it. Um, <laughs> You know, it's, uh, um, it, it takes over um, not just our lives, but uh, all the physical space we have. That we, we have freight deliveries to our house. Like freight, this isn't like UPS, but like tractor trailers where the guy is supposed to have a lift gate and doesn't says, where's your loading dock? <laughs> okay, just dump it in the pool, jackass. Like, <laughs> that guy set him in the road and I had to pile in every box by hand into my garage, you know. I can fit four skids of bags in my garage and that's it. I mean, that's 2,000 bags, straight up. Um, and then we have to stuff them all. We have to roll all the t-shirts. I mean, the, the, the st bag stuffing process alone is ours. We start, we start staging in the morning. At four o'clock, people show up to our house and we start stuffing bags and we finish usually between midnight and 2 a.m., right? So if we want to get bigger, then we're going to go until 4 a.m. or 6 a.m. or you're not going to get a damn bag. And we don't want to get to the point where you don't get a damn bag. And could we outsource that? Yeah, I mean, we could outsource it. We could do it here, but again, the, they start to cost money. They start to take even more time. You know, and it's just, it's a, it's a lot of work. I mean, it, it's hard to overstate how much effort goes into planning the conference from all the volunteers, you know, from everyone from the photographers, the, the streaming video folks, to the uh, program committee, to our own personal times. You know, Heidi and I basically, you know, I know personally, I can't speak for other people, but um, from the end of Christmas until this con, at, there's no free time. Like, if there's a spare moment in the day, it's going to be filled up with Shmukan stuff. That's what we do. You know, I have another job, I do it, and then I work on this. Hadi works on this and takes care of our kids. We wake up at 6 a.m., we do this, we go to bed at midnight, wash, rinse, repeat seven days a week for a month, right? It's a lot of work. And so there's this bit of selfishness in here that if we got much bigger, it would pretty much nuke from Thanksgiving on, and I at least like my turkey, so screw that. <laughs> No more Smooball. Um, Smooball's been dead for two years. Came back virtually this year with the moose. Uh, the moose is clearly a work in progress. Uh, we were, I think one of the biggest feedbacks we've heard about is there needs to be more instantaneous feedback. The speaker said something you don't like, the moose should respond instantly. It shouldn't be like you, the speaker said something you didn't like 10 minutes ago and then the moose goes off and it was like, well that's just annoying. Uh, <laughs> I still think it's funny. I think I'm the only guy, like every time I get this, I'm like, I'm giggling and like no one else is giggling. I'm like, oh God. I guess I'm a troll at heart, I'm not really sure. I'm, I'm um, hearing rumor that next year, in order to actually throw your schmoo ball, you will actually have to shake, the shake your phone. Thing. So, um, which I envision will be like we 1.0 problems, you know, <laughs> oh God. <laughs> <laughs> Except instead of going through the TV, it's gonna go into the head of the person in front of you. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, um, uh, we'll see, we'll play with it. I mean, but the goal again is to foster audience interaction. Um, and, and this was kind of a grand experiment to try something, you know, totally different than we've tried before. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, from that perspective it was interesting. And, and like all experiments, I mean, there's successful parts and unsuccessful parts. We well, learned a lot. And we, we dreamed this up one night at like, what, December 27th? <laughs> yeah, it was pretty late in the game. And um, honestly, the, uh, uh, the 757 crew, uh, are any of them in here? One, one, we, 
manning their moose. Oh, they're all manning. They probably are manning the moose. These guys put it together. There's one guy, but he has many personas. Um, <laughs> And they put this together over the last month. They worked really hard, including buying things from Harbor Freight. Um, one of the problems they had while the air horns didn't work is because their relays, their 40 amp relays on those air compressors that blow the horns, and they bought 40 amp relays and they blew them out instantly. Um, and after they were, when they were out looking for the other relays at like Radio Shack, um, they took the relays that they bought and opened them up. And inside the 40 amp relay was a circuit board with a five amp relay soldered onto it. Um, <laughs> Technically, not a 40 amp relay for the, the EEs in the room. Um, so anyway, there's some, some challenges. Some challenges that had to be overcome. Supply chain, you know, corruption notwithstanding. Um, so it's a work in progress, but I have a lot of faith. Oh, and I got to thank the Mobile Disco crew for griefing it right off the bat. Um, they even had an iPhone app to grief it. Um, they could just, they, they collected 100. Yeah, it's, it's actually, you know, you know that there's going to be shenanigans. And so Jakku, the redheaded guy that looks like Sean White with a gut. Um, <laughs> Boy, I'm so glad he's not here, but he's going to hear that, and I'm going to get it later. Um, <laughs> they, uh, they collected barcodes from people, because they had a barcode to throw a schmoo ball. They stood outside registration and collected 120 barcodes. So after they were redeemed. After they were redeemed. So he was dedicated to the cause. I tried to lift them out of his pocket, but he had actually collected so many, they were jammed in, and I'm not very good at lifting, and so he noticed. And, um, and then they wrote an iPhone app, and then you just say, select the number of schmoo balls you want to throw and hit, and it gives you the status, and the, and the, and the, burr, and the horn goes off. So I was like, wow, that's great. Thank you for doing that. Uh, but they're actually going to be working with the 757 guys next year to make a more refined app that's less likely to, or less able to be griefed and has more interactivity with the audience. So we'll see how, how that works out. All right, the meat of this thing. Uh, we're going to tell you about the dollars. Uh, sponsorship this year was over $100,000 came in. Ticket sales is about $221,000, so in total. I did that math in my head. She did do that math in her head. <laughs> <laughs> That's the most applause there's been all day for adding a one. <laughs> Watch me divide later. <laughs> <laughs> I've had too much caffeine. <laughs> Um, here's what we spent. I'm not going to go read this because you're capable of reading. Um, but we spent about $210,000. Uh, we are insured for like the third year in a row. Um, um, yay, yay. <laughs> it's peace of mind, I tell you what. Um, these slides will be posted online so you, people don't need to go crazy transcribing. Again, this just gives you an idea of scale. Um, the hotel space, um, you know, a lot of it gets covered by the room commitments that we make. Uh, but we, one of the biggest problems we have uh, with the way that we run the conferences, since we don't ask you who you are when you show up, um, if you register outside the block, um, we don't really have a clear way of tracking you. And so one of the trade-offs we make is, hey, please let us know if you've registered and you're outside our block because you found cheaper rooms somehow so that we can get... Uh, um, well, and let's talk about that. Well, so one thing, we don't need to know who you are, we just need to know your reservation number. So if you're worried about maintaining anonymity, that's cool. You can just give us a reservation number, we can't track honestly, that back. Yeah, we don't, we, don't, we don't care. Information doesn't go anywhere. Um, but the problem is if, we, if there's a miss, like we make a room commitment when we sign the contract. We say we're going to, you know, a thousand room nights or whatever. Um, and if we don't make that, if we're, if we're short by a certain number, then we'll owe the, uh, owe the difference as if the rooms were filled. So at 160 bucks a night, you multiply that by the number of rooms that you're short, and that's what the check we would have to write to the hotel. Now, in reality, it's the actuals that matter. But about a month in advance, there's a cut line where the hotel says, all right, if you're, there's a big miss, we want to see some money. So that you know, you know, if there is that miss, then you have we have cash in hand, and we're not out a bunch of money because you're out of cash because your event didn't go right or whatever the hell is going on. Um, and so, because of the way that we sell tickets, because we do it anonymously, because we do it kind of not quite last minute but pretty close for that last round, um, we don't see that big pickup until a couple weeks before the con. And we end up, you know, kind of having this little dance with the hotel of, well, you're a little short, but we know you're going to make it, but you're a little short, um, and. That's really what, what nailed us this year. Oh, yeah, being able to prepay at like $126. I mean, for people that wanted to save money and come in here on their own dime, that was a hell of a deal. And, you know, how are you going to pass that up? Um, and, the, the, you know, hotel. the hotel offered, like, we can take that off the table. If you don't want us to allow that rate for that night, we can get, you know, take it off. We're like, no. You know, we, if you want to save money, that's fine. Like, we want you guys to be here as cheaply as possible, so please keep that rate in the books. And then that's why we go on Twitter so aggressively and say, if you've registered outside the block, tell us. You know, because we're not trying to screw you guys. We want to, I mean, get you guys here and save as much money as, you can, as we can for you. Was the, uh, was the room block giving you the free space, or were they actually charging for the room space? Our, our, 
commitment this year, um, the space was free. Yeah, I mean, it, for for as big as this hotel is, when we put a thousand room nights or whatever on the books, then we get the space for free. Um, we commit for a thousand room nights. We only have to make eighty percent. That's pretty standard. So. Yeah, but we still have to pay for you know, internet. $10, this stuff. <laughs> yeah, internet's not cheap in hotels. $10, yeah, and all this, you know, every extension cord that we ask for because we're short and every easel we ask for, you know, and every whatever, I mean, boom, it's a big bill. Like, and it's funny because, like, we wanted to use the overhead speakers in the uh, um, TF2 room for the Hack Fortress stuff, and one of the PSAV guys came in and plugged it in, and the other PSAV guy came in and said, you know that's $600 to use that for the weekend? And we're like, I'm playing from the wall. <laughs> We'll, we'll use the speakers we brought, thanks. Um, you know, so it's stuff like that where, I mean, it, that's the way the hotels make money on events. It's not the space. They make that up in the rooms. It's all the services associated with it. Um, one of the challenges I found is that the, um, the reduction in rates can actually be better for, like, AAA than the comp rate. Yeah, the AAA rate was, was, $10. was $10 less. Um, We're not getting, I mean, there's a lot of ways people could, could get rooms without being on it. And um, people are required to book through their corporate travel. Same thing. Yeah, we won't see it. Yeah. Um, and, and in reality, you know, these rates are set way in advance. Oh, wow, I'm running late on time. So, um, yeah. Uh, so there's some money left over, about as much, you know, as, as we expected to have. It's because, frankly, we don't want to lose money. I mean, ultimately, this is the LLC, and I, the LLC lives in the house that we own, and we don't want the house to go away because Shmukon didn't work out. Um, you know, so we like having buffers at the end. Um, although, in fairness to almost every other conference organizer out there, we probably have it the easiest because our math is relatively deterministic because we know we're going to sell out. Um, and a lot of people don't have that luxury. And I can appreciate the challenges that other conferences have to go through and the fact that we are um, really fortunate in that regard. And we appreciate all the attendees showing up and being so positive, um, and it, but it makes our lives a lot easier to know the math in advance. Um, but we still got to have space in case, you know, sheetrock falls in the car and suddenly it was our fault. Um, you know, that can be a big, I mean, that kind of stuff. For like the Hilton, like the guy from the Hilton's explaining like, yeah, some material was being uh, hoisted in the air by a contractor and the load shifted and it fell on a vehicle and told of it. Uh, do you need more water over here? You know, that was like, that was like the threshold of like how bad it was. You know, it wasn't like a catastrophic event. If that had been something that happened as due to our negligence or something, like I would have been in a heap on the floor with lawyers, oh God, you know, like it would have been a disaster, you know, because the Hilton has billions of dollars in a war chest somewhere and we have this and if it exceeds this, we're fucked. Um, so, <laughs> giggle, giggle, all your house would go away. <laughs> um, we're moving into you. Yeah, exactly. I'll move. Yeah. Next year, if you want a ticket, you got to give us a place to live for a week. Um, I got a dog and a couple cats. Um, Louise is not here. He's running a marathon. So Ken read the labs um, and the network and everything. Is Ken here? No. No. Ken's uh, probably gone. Ken's probably, yeah. Oh, Ken is gone. Um, and so Brett was uh, number, Thor was number whatever in command. Um, everything went well? Uh, yeah. As far as we know. People love it. <laughs> Sometimes they don't tell us things till later. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it, how many people use the network? Man, that's some balls. Um, <laughs> oh, no, these, I, I did no such thing. <laughs> so um, it, it's a, a grand experiment. There's a lot of people using, I mean, a lot of different networks they have to maintain. I mean, we got different networks for the podium, for the moose, for the streaming video, for all you people to use on different, you know, different types of wireless security. Um, registration has its own. I mean, it's a complicated network to set up. So, um, you know, big thanks to the network guys for getting that all cranking. Yeah. This is the part we, yeah. Uh, Um, another area that we're really fortunate in is on-site registration. Um, the, the system that was originally designed uh, uh, by, by CAS uh, has continued to be used over the years. Um, we use barcode scanners that don't scan like phones and things and bad printers. Um, that may change next year. We may go to something a little bit more aggressive. Um, but uh, if you walk up with your barcode and it scans, we give you a bag, you get the hell out and you go. Um, so it's um, amazingly smooth. The line moves, I mean, Line moved quickly. I, people, yeah, I mean, we can get people in and out of there pretty fast, uh, which is nice. And it's something that from day one. So do my friends who are lining up on Friday morning at 8 a.m. <laughs> we have plenty of bags. You can have more. Um, eight seconds of pop. Eight seconds of pop? For, for how many? The first 500. First 500, we did one every eight seconds. So, um, 
you know, that's pretty, and another reason why we want to keep it anonymous, we don't want to take time and look at your goddamn driver's license, like, <laughs> just scan it and get the hell out, you know. Uh, so, eight seconds of pop, um, the registration team works really hard, and again, there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes to make that moment happen, so that there's just a, you know, a non-stop flow of bags, and the barcodes are being scanned, and the database is updated, I mean, it's pretty, um, it's pretty amazing system, so uh, thanks for putting that together. Uh, video streaming. Yeah, I'm gonna have to start the motor. Um, it, it's been going well, streaming people. So, um, and, and the internet folks, I think um, I've totally ignored the internet, so I'm just going to assume it went well because of the internet and I can just assume things about it. Um, we, we upgraded our gear, which is probably the most important thing to note this year. Um, last year we were using these HP something or other Core 2 Dealey Bobbers, um, and we had no way of monitoring the stream. This year we deprecated those to be monitoring workstations so we could interact with them on IRC and make sure the stream was going okay. And we've got... <laughs> Anybody need a male child age nine? We are very proud of our boy, though. <laughs> no, but apparently he picks locks. He got second place in the uh, black bag contest with, the, with another Bob, so, yeah. Um, anyway, the new laptops are i7s uh, with a lot of memory, and they, they, worked, uh, re they worked well? Okay, good. Oh yeah, so Adobe, we use uh, Flash Media Encoder, Flash Media Live Encoder, which is a very interesting piece of software. Um, <laughs> and the ADD converters uh, that are USB based are very interesting pieces of hardware. Um, and I, I swear to God, like I don't, this stuff, all oh, it's it's not fun. Um, I spent hours um, over the last couple of weeks troubleshooting this so that it would work when we got here. But um, you can get it to work, and anyone that wants to stream, you can email us and we can give you the secret sauce so you can at least learn from our mistakes on that. Um, but we had a lot of people watching online. I put that, we put that up there without actually asking. We had a lot of people watching online. We assumed. Great. So, um, yeah, cool. Um, so you can stay home next year and watch it online. Um, that would really cut down cost. It would cut down cost. Um, as long as you buy a ticket, though. You gotta buy a ticket and then stay home. Um, security, so we provide our own security staff. They don't dress differently. They all wear the same staff uh, shirts, which um, we like because we want people to feel like they can come up to anybody and ask questions, or at least they can serve as traffic cops and direct you to different places. Um, uh, we, all, all answers point to Reg. Yeah, all answers. Yeah, usually, if you don't know the answer, go to, go to registration. Um, radios, we rent the little in-ear secret service radios from a local vendor. Um, but also, we have after-hours security that we, that the hotel has like a list of third-party contractors they work with. We contracted them and we have somebody sit in the halls and try to make sure at least things are relatively safe. We don't make any assurances, but it's an attempt to keep um, things in check down here. Um, we did buy some more servers, and what, one thing we found is as the labs have progressed, in the beginning years, we needed a lot of servers because there was a lot of stuff running on bare metal. Now, a whole hell of a lot of it is virtualized, right? I mean, yeah, and so now we just get big iron with big memory and only a handful of them, and those critters run. Um, so, you know, du dual socketed quad-core Xeons with 32 gigs of memory will do a lot, as it turns out. <laughs> They're kind of monsters. Um, and so, I mean, it was a good setup. I mean, that worked out pretty well. Yeah, we had uh, space and resources to spare. Good. Um, so for people thinking about doing this, you know, virtualization is your friend. You just need a big enough piece of iron to run it. Uh, but man, I tell you, if you get Dell at the right time, you can get dual socketed Xeon servers for relatively cheap. I mean, these are under two grand or under three grand a piece. Um, yeah, you just gotta, they have specials. You gotta keep kind of refreshing every once in a while. Uh, now I buy today. Um, and, Cause they'll give you like the second processor free, which is usually the big expense. That's like a five or $600 hit for the big now high end Xeons. <laughs> no, they won't. Uh, contests, all contests were back um, this year. Um, how many people participated in any contest at all? It's not a bad number. Um, we, um, the black bag contest was the, the first time that they ran it. They, they retired Gringo Warrior in the Lockpick Village and did the black bag thing instead, um, which was a success. Although one of the bits that involved live 120 volt electricity um, was kiboshed because they couldn't get it to work safely or without blowing up the UPS, which was Fine by us. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they talk about insurance. We didn't tell the insurance uh, underwriter, hey, by the way, there'll be bare metal wires with electricity running through it. And No. Um, 
uh, so anyway, well, I'm, these contests will be back. Hack Fortress, we had to turn people away. Um, I know during signups, um, Gits, Gits had a lot of people on, had a lot of people uh, online playing. So again, hammer's going down. Uh, we had about 44 uh, sponsors. The bronze sponsorship level is a level we reserve for small businesses, and we enforce that very aggressively. We get companies, big companies that write in, and I think they're basically trying to buy tickets for people and avoid the line. Um, and the big companies that write in trying to buy the bronze level, we tell them absolutely not. These are for you know startups and small companies and to make sure that they have good exposure in the community as well. Um, you know, the big boys can pay big money to be sponsors. Um, the little guys, you know, well, it, no, we don't, we don't, it's not a huge tax. I mean, we don't take a lot, even at the high end. Um, but we don't intend this to be a vendor show. We really, really, really impress upon the, the uh, sponsors to try to be interactive, to try to do something different, to try to make the conference better th by being here, not just try to get resumes or pimp their product or whatever. And a lot of them take it very seriously, uh, which we're, we're very uh, thankful to have the support that we have in the, in the sponsor community. Um, feedback, 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 feedback. Please, um, oh, this is actually the last slide. It is the last wow, slide. Wow, I made it. I know have, Laura's not going to come up here and sl can you hold up the stop sign just to thank you. That's all I need. Uh, I know. I just it was more just the I like it. Can we can we share a funny story? Yeah. What's your funny story? He has one. Okay. There's a story time. Story it, was the Blues Clues. Okay. I can let you play, uh, relay that one. So hey, hi, I'm Richard. I've been at Labs for like the last three years on the wireless team, and uh, I'm the guy who usually brings a spool of Cat5 to get all the access points and switches linked together. So yeah, all. All thanks go out to Dragorn, who actually brings, I think, 20 access points this year. Um, I think there were 400 people that were actually on the network. About 30% were on the WPA2 network, so your stuff was secure. Um, so anyways, in this very room, on that very switch, there were two access points that were not lighting up, and we had no idea why. So I go back to the knock and I say, okay, can you please go connect into the switch and figure out what's going on with the power over Ethernet, because that's how the APs get their uh, power. So I come out here with new APs, new wires, because Matt Hum, the guy who brings the switches and terraces, thank you. He says, check the wires. So I bring out a new Ethernet cable, bring in a new AP, process of elimination, stuff's not working. So just because these APs can run off of wall warts, I have two in my pockets to get the two APs running. I plug the APs in, plug the power into the AP, and then lift up the tablecloth here. It's like, Where's the power strip? The, have you ever heard of a power over Ethernet switch? Yeah, these are powered over Ethernet switches. It was actually being fed power over the Ethernet jacks, and that's why the APs were not uh, lighting up. They didn't have enough power to plug the APs in to give them power. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this switch was working, passing traffic, manageable, trunking to the next room, trunking to the next room, but it had wasn't getting fed power from the wall. <laughs> so yeah, I told Matt and he's like, wow, I had no idea they could do that. <laughs> so, uh, and Rick here found something on the wireless from his wireless pen testing stuff. <laughs> Come on up. You have five seconds to do it. All right, so this is the Hacker Conference. Shame on all of you until about 5 o'clock on Friday. There was an unencrypted access point on the management network. Thank you for not hacking us. <laughs> <laughs> all right, last, uh, the last appeal before we uh, wrap this up. I'm sorry I can't take any more questions right now. Um, you can, again, you can. Here's the, here's the best way. Um, feedback. Um, go to the feedback. <laughs> you know what? The one we thing my son doesn't like about ShmooCon is the Shmoo balls are gone. And it's, he's actually <laughs> distraught about it. So he's taking it out. Anyway. <laughs>